Good morning and welcome to worship this morning at First Presbyterian in Denison and Grand Avenue Presbyterian in Sherman. So good to have you here today on this first Sunday in Advent. And on December 16th, we've been invited to uh, a Hanukkah dinner with the congregation Beit um, in our fellowship hall. So I look for details about that. That will be coming up um, in just a few weeks. Friends, the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. you. Let us worship God. Today is the first Sunday in the season of Advent. Advent means coming, and in this season we prepare for the coming of Christ. We light the candles on the Advent wreath to remind us of the blessing that Christ brings to the world. We are preparing ourselves for the days when the nations shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Please join in saying, let us walk in the light of the Lord. call to worship. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, that we may learn God's ways and walk in God's paths. Our feet are standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. The opening hymn is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. You know what time it is. Now is the time to wake from sleep. Salvation is near. Let us confess our sin. 
God of night and day. There is no shadow that can conceal our sin from you and no secret that you will not bring to light. O oh God, forgive us our sins, renew us in love, and teach us to live in a way that brings honor and glory to your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A moment of silent confession. Please join me in saying, in his name we pray, amen. The assurance of pardon. Beloved, in your baptism you were bathed in light and clothed with grace. Therefore, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Know that you are forgiven and live in peace. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The Hebrew lesson today is Isaiah 2, verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> the word that Isaiah, son of Amoz, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains, and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against the nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Our gospel reading for the morning comes to us from the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. Hear now this word. But about that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together, one will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Thanks be to God. When we think about the future of the church, what does it look like to you? The future of the church. Brian McLaren, writing in a column in Richard Rohr's Daily Devotional, asks the question about the future of the church and what it might look like. He points out that in some ways, that's a question that can be threatening for people. It's threatening because even to ask it means that there probably is something afoot. When we look at the future of the church, he says some people may think of the future of the church as being bright and good. Of course, Christianity is always going to be with us. Christianity is always going to be present. And so, in that sense, if you have a bright, optimistic future uh, look at the church, it may be that you're inclined to say, we don't have anything to worry about. Maybe it looks like it's at a low point right now, but, but ultimately we don't have anything to worry about. And in that sense, it can allow us to relax, to be complacent, to not worry about it. Others may have a bleak look at the church and at Christianity. They may be inclined to say, it doesn't look good. Look look at what has been happening to churches all over the nation, especially post-pandemic, where some churches are at such a low ebb that they may be closing. It looks like there's no real future for Christianity, and if it looks like there's no real future, then in a sense, what can I do? There's there's nothing that I can do, and so it becomes easy to absolve myself and to say, it's someone else's worry, or what's going to happen will happen, and there's nothing I can do about it anyway. I'm, I'm powerless. McLaren says, if you look at the church's history, though, if you look at where the church came from, the church did not have a set of beliefs that were dropped into history and, um, and we simply were able to take them and to carry on. The church, he says, has been a part of adapting and changing looking creatively at the situation that the church is in and and adapting to it, changing to the situation around the church, looking at the church's mission and what may be possible or what may be important for the church to do as it moves into the future. 
as it develops new beliefs, as it develops new understandings, as it copes with the situation around it and adapts to it to be able to say, here's maybe how we're to be ready. Here's what we're to be doing. When we hear this word from Matthew this morning, it sounds like a bleak word. The, the word from Matthew that we hear, um, the word from Jesus that we hear through Matthew is one in which he's speaking about his return. But in a sense, it's one of those times when we have to put on our bifocals or our trifocals to be able to hear this passage well and to have a little deeper understanding of its meaning and what, is, what it is that's happening. Jesus was speaking toward the end of the Gospel of Matthew, shortly before the time he would be arrested and hung on a cross, would die, and then would be resurrected. He was speaking in anticipation of that time, knowing that his end was coming, but a new beginning would be there. And so he was offering a warning to people to say, there are things coming, but I'll be returning. I'll be coming back. In other places, he says, even before this generation passes away, I'll be back. That would be to look up close at what it is that Jesus is talking about, about his imminent return. It's going to happen any time. Um, he will be arrested and die. He'll be resurrected. And then he'll return. He'll be with the people. He'll bring everything together. God's reign will be with us. And so things will happen. But Jesus will be there with us. It'll happen soon. If we're to look at the middle part of our lenses at the time that Matthew is writing his gospel, close to some 50 years after Jesus spoke these words, the church was struggling. The church was wondering what it is it could do as the church waited on Jesus' return and it had not been imminent. He had not come back right away they were still waiting, still trying to be ready, still looking for what it is they were supposed to do. And it came at a particular time in history. By roughly the year 80, the Jewish insurrection had happened 15 or 16 years earlier, where there was a Jewish uprising that was going to try to throw the Roman army off to get rid of the Roman Empire, to no longer be under its rule. And then that uprising was put down. And to finish it off, the temple itself was destroyed in 70. So here's a little band of Christians. Some 15 or 16 years after the Jewish uprising that was supposed to throw off the Roman Empire, it had not succeeded. Now, some 10 years after the temple itself had been destroyed, they'd not only been kicked out of the synagogue, there was no synagogue to go to. The temple was gone. The place that was the center of Jewish life, the center of the Jewish world, no longer existed. So they were wondering, what is it we're supposed to do? How are we supposed to be ready for this? What does it look like to be a follower of Jesus when it's been some 50 years since he was supposed to come back, that it would be imminent? And then if we look through the longer distance, we look at where we are, we look at where we are a couple of millennia after Jesus' life and ministry, his death and resurrection, where we hear these words once again. Jesus tells us people were marrying, 
People were having children. People were doing all of the things that we do in life at the time of Noah. And then a great destruction came that they had not anticipated, even though Noah tried to tell them about it. There were other times when terrible things happened. And here Jesus has been warning the people that great and terrible things will happen. In some ways, I think he's, he's speaking both at the personal level and at the corporate level. He's speaking about the ways, I think, not in which he's offering some kind of threat or scaring people with the possibility of two women working together and one of them being raptured up, taken away, and the other left behind with nothing and no promise of Jesus' presence. I think instead, maybe what Jesus is talking about is the way in which good and wonderful things will happen to us in life. And there will also be terrible, unexpected things that will come our way. We may be blessed with the goodness of children. We, we may know the wonder and the beauty of relationships that are loving and enduring. And we may also know what it means when an aneurysm bursts and someone is suddenly gone. We may know what it means when a diagnosis comes that is terrible and frightening. The only thing you can do is hold someone's hand. Some may know the terrible time when someone says, I don't wish to be a partner with you anymore. Or a job comes to an end. Or you lose a house that you've loved. All kinds of things, terrible things can happen. They happen at a personal level, they happen at a corporate level, they happen at a national level. They happen across the world. Terrible destruction comes. What Jesus speaks about though is being ready. Being ready. How is it that those first hearers of Jesus coped with hearing these words? What is it we're to do? Jesus cautioned them, offered words to them, told them about being ready. And being ready, I think, means following Jesus, going and serving, going and doing the things that Jesus has been doing. As we go and do those things, we're, we're getting ourselves ready for Jesus' return. On a different level, I think what it means is, as Brian McLaren speaks about it, that we are a church that is called to be creative, to adapt, to recognize that we're not an institution that is about preserving itself, but we're an institution that's called to challenge ourselves and other institutions to be reconciled to God. Not just the church, but, but all other institutions, our nation itself, the world itself, to be reconciled to God. And what does that mean? It means that we begin with ourselves, reconciling ourselves to God looking at what our relationship with God is like and how it may need to change, how it may need to deepen, how it may need to adapt, how it is that we are to be reconciled to neighbors, those around us who find themselves in need, those around us that we don't always get along with, those around us who are farther from us, whose names we may not know, but 
we are called to be a part of them, connected with them, in relationship with them, through the church, through other institutions, through other bodies, to be reconciled to them in loving ways. Even to be reconciled to enemies, those who would come at us or would hate us or would try to do something destructive. We're, we're called to be constructive, to move in a positive direction as a part of being reconciled to them and reconciled to the world. We're called to work on being reconciled to creation itself so that we would recognize ourselves as partners in creation rather than looking at creation as something to be used or abused or taken advantage of. Called to adapt, to change, to look at things in constructive ways, to look at the ways in which we can go about doing things in the world that call us to be ready for the presence of God. It happens by serving. How is it that we can most be ready? By going and serving, by caring for those in need, by holding hands with those who find themselves in trouble. When those terrible things strike, being ready to go and be present with those who've been left without a hand to hold. Going and being a part of the presence of God, recognizing that God makes a promise to always be with us. Jesus made a promise to the people who were following him that he would return it didn't happen right away, but they were called to be ready, to be reconciled, to be reconciled to God, to self, to neighbor, to enemy, and to the world. It's what God would call us to do, to be ready now, as we begin the season of Advent, of, of looking of watching, of waiting for the possibility of God's presence being with us. As Isaiah tells us, we're to go and do the things that God would have us do. Isaiah tells us generations before Jesus spoke about the things that we're to do, the ways we're to go and serve, to care for people in loving ways, to make the presence of God known, God's reign here among us. At the beginning of Advent, as we look and watch and wait, getting ready for something good to happen, getting ready for the presence of God, when we already know, when we already love, getting ready as we look at new ways to go and serve. Let us stand and say together what we believe. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere the giver and renewer of life. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. The same Spirit who inspired the prophets and apostles rules our faith and life in Christ through Scripture engages us through the word proclaimed, claims us in the waters of baptism, feeds us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation, and calls women and men to all ministries of the church. In a broken and fearful world, the Spirit gives us courage to pray without ceasing, to witness among all peoples to Christ as Lord and Savior, to unmask idolatries in church and culture, to hear the voices of peoples long silenced, and to work with others for justice, freedom, and peace. In gratitude to God, empowered by the Spirit, we strive to serve Christ in our daily tasks and to live holy and joyful lives 
even as we watch for God's new heaven and new earth, praying, Come, Lord Jesus. Friends, let us join together in a word of prayer for those persons in our concerns. Let us pray. God, we come to you in thanks for the ways that you love us, for the ways that you show your promise to us, for the ways that you continue to call us to serve you faithfully. As we seek to go out into the world, we pray that we may have eyes that are able to see in new ways and ears able to hear new things so that we are better able to respond to the needs of the world. We pray today for Barbara as she continues to await the possibility of a transplant. We give thanks for her patience and for her determination for Christine as she waits for the possibility of comfort and relief. We pray that with healing and with time, she may know a sense of strength and comfort once again. We come to you in thanks for the lives of Michael Johnson, and Ed Baxter, and Dan Daniels, for the ways in which they each led lives of significance to other people. We give thanks for their witness to you. We pray for those who have loved them, that they would be comforted by your presence, that they would recognize the ways in which they are able to rely upon your shoulder to lean upon. We pray that they too would have the shoulders of those of us who care for them, that they would have hands to hold, to help walk with them through this time of grief. We are reminded that in life and in death, we belong to you and we entrust their souls to your loving presence. We pray too for the people of Ukraine as the conflict that they are in continues into this winter season. We pray for those who face the cold, short supplies of water and food. We pray for their determination, for their will to be known as a nation that is able to lead itself without the influence or the interruption of a foreign power. We pray that we may be a part of continuing to assist them, that we would stand together with many other nations in the world to help be a part of their self-determination. We pray for the day when peace will come, when the sense of security will be known, when we may step closer to 
knowing what it means for your reign to be present with all of us. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord. Amen. Friends, now let us give to God the Lord's tithes and our offerings. It's done in Malawi and other parts of Africa where people come forward and dance with joy and each bring their offering to the plate at the front. What a, what a great way of doing that. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We live in love to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks. Lord our God, we come to you in thanksgiving for all the ways that you call us together to be your people, the ways that you give us these opportunities to offer ourselves and our gifts to you. We pray that you would take us and use us in proclaiming your good news in every part of your creation. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Friends, now may the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our maker, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and in every moment of your living. The Lord be with us. The Lord be with us all.